And now for the main event, uh, today's HUD uh, NSP webinar is intended to give NSP grantees and all NSP affiliates the opportunity to ask questions they have about the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Topics may include NSP3, program design, NSP compliance, or any other current issue of interest. So this webinar is for NSP 1, 2, and 3 grantees and their partners. Uh, with us today, uh, we have uh, David Noguera. And uh, is John with you too, David? Uh, yes, she, I'm here, and David is moving furniture, but he'll be right back. <laughs> okay, so we, we do have uh, David Noguera and John Laswick. Um, yes, and, Pardon? Hunter Kurtz is on with us as well. And Hunter Kurtz, yes. And they all show up under the name Hunter Kurtz in the, uh, in the panelist list. And, uh, I don't, no, Survey is with us. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to make Survey a panelist. And, uh, I will also unmute Survey. Sorry about that. And, uh, no, no problem. Survey DeVere from Enterprise Community Partners. So, uh, welcome back to each of you. Uh, we've done these several times before, and uh, let's see, so we've got um, hot topics today. What are those, John? What are those hot topics? Well, uh, the weather's pretty hot here in D.C. Um, in your nation, it's, uh, it's in the 60s, it's supposed to be in the 70s tomorrow. The cherry blossoms are starting to come out, so we're feeling like uh, <coughs> humans again. And um, I guess the hottest topic is that uh, yesterday the House of Representatives approved the NSP3 Termination Act, um, delicately named, uh, and uh, in a not surprising um, uh, move, uh, although there was a spirited debate all afternoon for those of you who uh, managed to catch any of that. Uh, what does that mean for you? Well, um, the act requires... If it's approved by the Senate and signed by the President, um, it, it would require uh, us to return any unobligated NSP3 funds to the Treasury. And that was largely the, the thrust of the objection. Uh, it wasn't such that it was a bad program. It's just that we shouldn't be spending money on, on a lot of things these days. So, um, But um, while we cannot specifically say how many applications have been approved, um, it, it's a large number, um, a large percentage of the NSP3 substantial amendments have been approved uh, by HUD. Um, once they are signed by your field office CPD director, uh, those funds are considered to be obligated, and therefore, if you are among the lucky folks who have either received a letter from your field office or a, uh, a call from your CPD rep or NSP specialist saying that the grant has been approved, then uh, this this action will not affect you. Um, we put out a cert notice yesterday that the president and the OMB have, have said that they would not uh, approve this, but um, for the most part, we don't think it's, it's going to end up... Um, probably too many people. There are a number that um, have legitimate uh, issues that we're trying to figure out. Um, but I would like to give credit to our field office staff um, across the country who uh, uniformly um, broke uh, land speed records to get um, uh, applications approved. Um, and I, you know, I haven't seen all of the amendments. I haven't seen hardly any of them, frankly. But um, I guess I feel like if we went a little quicker this time than with NSP1, I'm, I'm less concerned because I think we went slower and more deliberately on the planning and development of the program, and so I'm hoping that uh, we actually have better programs uh, in place. Um, so uh, so that that's a hot topic, um, and you can ask uh, questions, but I think you should be hearing from your field office if you haven't by uh, the end of this week. Um, and uh, like I say, I, I think the large majority of people are, are really uh, in a position not to have to worry about that. So a couple of policies that we're working on here, I think we might have mentioned earlier, but um, 
they're they're a little farther along. Um, one is part policy, part instructions for make for doing amendments to your NFP substantial amendments in either NFP one, two, or three. Um, uh, and hopefully clarify when um, those changes are needed and you know what's an amendment, what requires an amendment, and in the case of NSP2, uh, you know, the procedures for submitting uh, enough material for us to re-rate the applications, which is what we have to do. We have been having a regular um, stream of those, not a rushing stream, but a pretty steady stream uh, of largely adjustments to um, target areas, and fortunately not huge adjustments, so I think we're pretty comfortable with all those. I think we've approved everyone so far, haven't we, Hunter? Okay. Um, so that'll, that should be coming out shortly. Um, we are also making really good progress on um, clarifying uh, how to uh, commit, how to make a an offer on a multifamily property without running a foul of the environmental rules. And uh, Charlie Dean and um, Daniel Chup here in, in our environmental staff and headquarters have been uh, Really doing a great job, and uh, Chris Hart now, their attorney, uh, is on board with this. So I think that within a couple of weeks, uh, we're going to have something out. But basically, the, the sort of the breakthrough is that um, what we did with NSP with NSP one and single family properties was to create the ability to do a conditional sales agreement, so that you can you can agree to purchase a property subject to completion of the environmental review. Now. Model family properties are not as, as simple as that, but um, but the only op the only chance that you had to come up with some some interim step was uh, in the uh, regulation so far is an option, and most of the uh, timing problems that we've seen are from uh, high cost areas where options are not an option. So uh, what we have. Um, gotten everybody on board with is uh, the creation of a conditional sales agreement uh, arrangement for multifamily properties as well, in which you would put down uh, a, a you know, modest amount of money to hold the property, uh, a non-refundable deposit, uh, up, uh, you know, in the 1% to 3% range, and hopefully that would buy you time to uh, get your environmental review done at the same time that you're keeping the property tied up. So, um, you know, this would, I think, give people, uh, sellers, a, a, a higher level of comfort because it is a conditional uh, agreement. It's not a, an option. So, you know, if the environmental works out, then you have to buy the property. So um, I think that's going to solve a lot of the problems that um, our uh, multifamily projects have been uh, struggling with uh, in the last year or so. And um, in addition, we, we you may still... Um, get involved with a multifamily property if the developer has purchased it um, with uh, non-NSP funds and is only coming into you, uh, as in the case of a state housing finance agency, they, they're only coming into you uh, requesting competitive um, funding for uh, rehabilitation. In that case, the federal funds, the project doesn't become federal until the uh, decision to approve the, the rehab funds uh, occurs, at which time you still have uh, the space to uh, complete an environmental review before uh, uh, the project, uh, you know, advances, but is still within the, the, the uh, rules of the environmental. So that's been out there for a couple of years, but we're trying to pull that into a companion a memo. It's right now in, in the form of a handful of FAQs, and, and uh, in general, we're trying to take some of those um, areas where there's a lot of FAQs and kind of merge them into more coherent policies. So, um, so I, I think those are two things that are are pretty hot. I know that um, you know if you've got a little family project, uh, it, it has been uh, sometimes difficult to know. Well, how do I make a commitment that keeps the project? An NSP project at the same time doesn't uh, get me in trouble with the environmental review process. So I am hopeful that in the next couple of weeks we uh, we will have that out. And uh, if you know we I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit more, but um, you know you might want to wait till till you see what we have. So, um, sort of did he anything on um, the uh, NDC training? Oh yeah, NDC training. Um, 
We mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. The, the announcement will go up uh, probably early next week. Um, these are going to be starting in uh, mid-April. We will have single-family and multifamily underwriting classes uh, all across the country in the primarily focused in the high uh, high intensity areas as far as MSP, which uh, are Florida, uh, California, and the upper Midwest. And then we'll have a couple. We'll have one in uh, New Orleans, one in the east, one in the east coast uh, right. of each. And, and, and these are four day trains, right? Four, four for single family, five for multifamily. Right. And, and and we're looking for those of you who participate to make a commitment to attend the 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 entire session. These sessions run for roughly what twelve hundred dollars per person. So which it, you don't have to pay, thank which you. you do not have to pay, thanks to our technical assistance dollars. But um, we want to make sure that um, we, we, we're getting our money for it. Right, right, and that you're receiving the training that uh, that you need. Um, this is this is available um, strictly to the grantees. But to the extent that you, as one of our NFC grantees, would like to invite one of your subrecipients, that's fine. They just have to um, have your approval. They can't come and, and register without your prior approval. These are um, these are training that um, the National Development Council has uh, offered for many years. So you, some of you have probably taken these classes. We had the multifamily one here in uh, headquarters just a couple of months ago, and single family and 10 multifamily ones. And we're hoping that that's enough space. We can do more of them after this first round if necessary, but for the first round, we think that we probably will limit um, uh, any individual grantee and its uh, subrecipients or developers to two spaces unless and then you know keep a have a waiting list uh, if, if other spaces open up um, I think it's it's a little hard for us to gauge how how big a demand there's going to be for it we're hoping that it's uh, that they're well uh, uh, attended but uh, we realize folks don't have a lot of travel funds and sometimes the dates don't work out so we, we do have more money to continue this next year so that it, for some reason it just doesn't work out for you um, it's not the end of the world um, but we would like to get this uh, information in front of people as soon as possible there will also be some webinars that will precede this as kind of um, overview of the concepts and some of the terms and some of the uh, math that you get involved with, they, they do require you to think and, and interact and do a lot of case studies. Uh, I think that's a good part of it because you you actually work with the stuff instead of just hearing about it. But um, those will uh, those are on our schedule already, and those are open to everybody. So you know you, you know even if you can't make it or you think you don't need it, a whole week's worth of training it's probably. Uh, valuable for you or some of your underwriting staff or your housing counselors or whoever to uh, to get some of that. So and, then, and you will get a certificate at the end of the training. So, and, and when does the first training start? I don't know the dates right now. It's, 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 it's about a month from now. April 11th for one, and April 12th for the other. Okay. okay. All right. So so we'll have those those dates up on the resource exchange. We'll also send out a list listserv message. But just wanted to give you a heads up as to what's coming. All right, so uh, that's all we have uh, to drop on you. I, one other thing, too. I mean, I know that sometimes you have a question that you're kind of nervous about, and uh, you, you'd rather not, uh, you know, sort of talk out loud. Maybe um, it's okay if you know if you'd like to write in on the questions and um, and say I'd like this to be anonymous. Uh, I'd rather have you ask the question anonymously than. Then worry about it and not get a good answer and make a mistake. So, um, if that makes you more comfortable about asking a question, that certainly doesn't bother me. So, Ken, you can open it up. Yeah. Now. So we'll we'll uh, take questions now. Um, thank you for the hot topics and uh, let us start with uh, James. Hi, James. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Jim Bryan calling from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Lawrence. Hi, John. <laughs> hey, Jim. Uh, uh, this is a NSP2 and NSP3 question. Uh, we're a sub-recipient 
with the state uh, in its day one, and the uh, federal obligated and, it, and uh, pretty much extended with that program. But we do have access to NSP 2 and 3. We'd like to provide additional um, amenities and rehab work to attract buyers at the 80% to 120% level, uh, maybe some higher-end appliances, uh, better countertops. What's, I've sort of lost track of, of this issue. Uh, what's the latest policy or program design guidance that would give us a comfort level in doing that? Uh, yeah, we, we refer to this as the granite countertop question. Um, and the answer is uh, you can do that because we are uh, we're selling houses in a competitive market, and uh, if you're competing uh, for the uh, – for the purchases of people with, uh, or you know, at any income range really, but if, you know, if you're in the 80 to 120 range and, and everything else they're looking at has granite countertops, then it's going to be hard for you to compete without that. I mean, that said, your costs have to be reasonable, and you know, you just still can't do the the gold faucets and, and so forth. But um, but you know, you have the flexibility in uh, in terms of uh, finish. Um, you know, green materials are also you know could add some uh, some costs. But uh, you know, we see those as um, legitimate um, uh, additions to the property for you know competitive purposes. Yeah. The, the other factor to consider is that you know some of these materials that you're using, like granite countertops, are, are durable purchases which will last a lot longer than a Formica top. And, and it's one of the justifications you can use as to why you chose one material over another. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Joe. So, we're happy to take more questions. And uh, you can do them. Verbally by raising your hand, you can do them in writing. And we've got uh, Sandra up next. Hi, Sandra. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Sandra Donaldson with the state of Alabama. How are you guys today? Hi. How are you this afternoon? Um, I'm just um, curious if you have any word yet on when the 2011 income limits may be available. Oh, geez, they always come out right around this time, Sandra. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I, last year it was like May. They generally come out in March, and, and I think one year it was February, but I know last year it was May. So we've got, you know, we have some grantees that have some prospective home buyers that are just outside the, the income limit. So they were just curious if, if when these come out they might be a little higher and they might be able to, to qualify some folks. Yeah, I, uh, we're going to try to get a hold of somebody up in policy development and research to see if they can give us a, a, a reading on that. Um, I know that sometimes it's, it's hard. Um, I think we had some cases last year where limits actually went down, which is... Yeah, so, <laughs> that could happen too. So. Yeah, so, um, but uh, let me, uh, you know, we'll, we'll announce that if we find anything. Uh, you know, I think the last couple of years, they've generally gone up, I think, in March, so I don't know... Uh, Maybe maybe I missed that. Um, we're asking, and uh, we'll make an announcement as soon as we hear something. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Sandra. And uh, yeah, go ahead and submit questions. Raise your hand. I've got one um, that uh, surveyed. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this or not, or if. Uh, um, how you how you feel about it? Do you know if there is any um, sort of organized campaign to uh, to start dealing with the NSP Termination Act? Um. Yes. Um. You know, the National Foreclosure Task Force has been working with it, and our policy side um, of Enterprise has been working um, in close um, connection with the Civilization Task Force. Um, and so I think letters have been circulated or at least an information piece on the House side to explain what NFC is and what NFC 1, 2, and 3 are and, you know, how they're benefiting communities um, and other sort of co-visits and so on are going on under the auspices of the task force. Um, I just talked to the PDNR folks and the uh, income limits for 2011. HUD uh, is hoping to have those out in April. 
There you go, Sandra, April for the 2011 income limits. Good, and uh, let's go to uh, Gail. Hi, Gail. Gail, are you there? I guess I have my phone on mute, too. Sorry about that. And there you go. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from the um, state of Wyoming. Ah. You don't get and calls from the state of Wyoming. Oh, no, we're a little smaller, but we've, we've done pretty well with the NSP1 and, and have it all committed on various houses and a couple of multifamily, and that's part of the question. We have one multifamily project that has NSP1 in it, and it is short of some funding, and I wanted to find out if we could use NSP3 to fund it if it's in the appropriate area. But what are some of the pitfalls we need to watch for so that we can do that? Well, I, I think you've already uh, spotted the biggest one, uh, which is that it's being you know, both relevant target areas for you know, NSP1 and 3. Um, but um, I, you know, I think you need to be... I mean, I'm assuming you haven't done anything yet. I mean, you know, there's going to be environmental require, you know, clearance requirements, but as long as you're doing those up front, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really change anything. Um, you know, and if you do it, you can do it for a combined, uh, you know, project. So we're, you don't have to do a separate, you know, release for one and three. It's all the same, you know, process. Um, I don't. Uh, We've actually completed the environmental review. Yeah, that's okay. good. So that's, we have. It's a, if it's the same project, and it sounds like it is, then you just have to, um, you know, kind of document your file that this is the same the same project, the same scope, the same everything, and, yeah. you know, just the additional funding. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, we actually encourage um, grantees to, to use their um, various funding sources um, in a collaborative fashion to, um, to, to support their projects. Um, the, the the one component I will say that's different between the two programs is that under NSP one you could do some uh, some commercial development you could do some um, public facilities that aren't necessarily housing um, but they support housing under NSP two and three you're, you're a bit more limited those wouldn't apply to you because you're dealing with housing so um, I, th I think you're good to go it sounds like um, You've addressed all the points that you need to. Good deal. Thank you very much. Oh, oh I, I, should, I should also mention those, but for um, DRG and reporting purposes, be sure to document the expenditures by program because they do, uh, they are funded by separate laws. Um, so, so, so it, it does need to be clear um, how the mon how each pot of funds are being used on that one project. Okay. okay. That should be no problem. Good. And if you get stuck, uh, you know, once you get close to closing or, you know, there's some detail, just let us know. We'll try to look it out for you. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Gail. And let's see. I see um, Krista's hand is up, but um, there's no phone icon next to your name. So, Krista, you've got two options. You can uh, submit your question in writing or you can follow the instructions on the slide you see here. And uh, in the meantime, let's go to uh, Deirdre. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Deirdre. Hi. Where, where are you? I'm in Houston. Oh. Um, I have a question about the NSP for Termination Act. Okay. Um, I just want to be perfectly um, sure that I'm understanding it correctly. If we have already signed our grant agreement and the local HUD office has already signed it as, as far as, as both parties have signed, then we're fine right now? You're, you're fine once the local HUD office signed it, actually. So, yes, you've got nothing to worry about. Okay, good. I just wanted to verify <laughs> one more time. Since we're squeaking it in on time, too. So. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We are very blessed over here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Deidre. And, uh, oh, very good. We've got uh, Krista on the line now. Hi, Krista. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Um, I have a question that uh, will take us back a ways to a couple or a few months ago. 
I um, asked a question a while ago about the land banking eligible national objectives or meeting the national objectives for land banking. Um, we have some guidance from you all uh, about demolitions and land banking and the items you can do in NSP1 versus NSP2. Uh, however, the guidance, I just want to make sure, I, I thought I checked this before and the answer was that you cannot do community gardens with NSP2 land banks, only with NSP1. But the way it reads is a little different. Can you elaborate? Um, so where the where did the property come from? You bought it? Did you demolish it or something? Or was it just vacant land? Or I guess like... Um, I believe that the exact the example we have in front of us right now is it's just vacant, not demolished, but it's foreclosed. So it would go in a land bank and then they would, I think their intent is to donate it for a community garden. Right. Um, we're, we're actually um, kind of trying to work out some of the uh, details on that. Um, it's my understanding that land banking... Um, what Jesse said the other day, but being in a land bank, it, it needs a national yeah, it for area the, benefit. Right. So it's only when you change the use, but in this case, you could be changing the use, that you, that you run into trouble because um, changing use puts you into a category in the CDBG regs, which says that um, you must need a national objective and um, in NSP, that it must be an NSP-eligible activity. So you've got kind of two two requirements then if you change the use. Um, and meeting a national objective in most of these areas is not going to be the, the problem. It's the what what's the eligible use. And if, and if it's not eligible in NSP, even though you're not using NSP funds to uh, construct the, the community garden, um, it, it might be a problem. Now, that's a little different than what I've been saying, at least, uh, a little more restrictive, but um, we're working on some options that would allow you to, for example, keep it in public ownership. Um, if the city or the redevelopment authority acquired it and, and doesn't sell it or gives the... Um, gives a community organization uh, an easement to it and therefore doesn't uh, transfer ownership uh, so that you can, you know, the property can be used for these other activities even though you, you can't use NSP funds to, to do the construction. We're still working on it, Lois, so I, I don't want to get too too far into this, but we should have something in the next couple of In the upper Midwest, uh, we got a lot of issues uh, with, uh, you know, subsequent use of uh, residential property that's, you know, not going to be residential for the foreseeable future. So um, we're trying to come up with something that's workable. I think that we will, um, but I, I'd, I'd rather kind of just leave it at this level to say, you know, give us a little more time to work it out because we haven't, you know, arm wrestled our attorneys yet and. Uh, and so, you know, and they're usually win, so, but <laughs> uh, they're good at time. Okay. But, um, so. So for now, at the very least, if they keep it in their, um, in their possession and propose that they may do a community garden if allowed, that would be fine for them. Yeah, yeah they, they wouldn't be able to use the funds to pay for the garden, um, um, redevelopment. Okay. But, um, but, but, but because, because that's not considered maintenance of land bank property, for example, right? I mean, that's the way you're so when it when it becomes a garden, it's coming out of this land bank. You you okay. you're disposing of it well, to to do to do the garden. I mean, well, only one would be maintenance. You know, planting stuff and putting up putting in water lines and various you know whatever else you might be doing is uh -huh. the same as maintenance. But I mean, well, I think. Uh, this morning with a, uh, a West Coast city that's doing the same kind of thing, and they had run up against the same problem with NSP 2 and 3. And, uh, you know, in their case, they just need the land. Um, they have the funds for the parks. And uh, I told them the same thing I told you, that I think we are going to have a, a solution, but it's okay. a little complicated. So I don't want to try to get into it here verbally and then um, end up confusing people even more. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Krista. Next up, we've got a uh, written question from Jeff. 
Jeff says that we have an NSP1 draw that was done as program income that should have been done as program funds. On yesterday's webinar, a grantee had the same situation and was instructed to email Mark Mitchell for assistance in correcting that draw in DRGR. Is that the best way for us to proceed as well, or is there a different option? Uh, well, I, I kind of missed the first part of that, Karen. What, what was the... Uh, so, uh, they, they have a, an NSP1 draw that was done as program income that should have been done as program funds. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that that is. I, in fact, I think I, I might have seen something in writing uh, to mark on that. I mean, I hope it doesn't come to that. Uh, uh, Jennifer Hilton might be able to help out with uh, some of those too. Uh, but Mark and uh, Jesse have the sort of access to more um, more of the DRGR system than, than some of us. So. Um, it's not impossible to do those corrections, and we we just assume have you do them as soon as you realize that it, it may be a little bit of a of a nuisance uh, to do it that way. But hopefully, we're going to try to get some DRGR training out there in the field too, so that we can you know help prevent that in the future. Good. But it's not a great solution because Mark's handling a lot of stuff. So uh, I mean, he's doing a great job, but it's just. He's got a lot, uh, a lot of balls in the air right now, so be patient. Okay, and let's go now to uh, Shelly. And I'll unmute you, Shelly. Hello, Shelly. Hello, Shelly. Must have stepped away from her phone, but she did uh, submit the question in writing. And uh, that was... Uh, there, there Hold on a second, Ken. Can, can, can we just uh, can go back to the other question? This is Hunter again. Um, we just talked to some of our DRGR folks, and they encourage you to uh, contact the help desk uh, because uh, typically uh, when Mark has a, a new problem, like, like I guess this one was, um, after he figures out how to solve it, he then trains the help desk folks. So uh, it's very likely that they will have a uh, an answer for you uh, uh, when you contact them. If not... Um, they'll uh, they'll get you to the right person who can help you with the uh, the problem. Great. Okay, that's good. That is good advice. And I you know I think the help desk is is really uh, expanded its capabilities. I mean they still can't get into sort of policy stuff, but I think they understand our program a lot better. I hope we is, we understand our program a lot better too. So okay, Shelly's question. Shelly, are you there? Nope, yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, now Sorry about that. I actually wrote my question in. But um, my question was on is the Head Form 5370EZ for small construction contracts of 2000 to 100000 required for our subrecipients and developers, developers to use? Uh, that's a new one. I mean, what, what's it about? Um, small contracts. Just and it was, it's, one of our um, housing authorities has it, and we didn't know if it was a requirement. Um, on our uh, monitoring, it came up, and we saw it, and we didn't know if all of our developers and subrecipients should be using it. I have not heard of that one. So it's ju you're just tracking small contractors. It's not a fair housing thing, or it's not a Section 3? Uh... No, no. Oh, it would be under, I think it's at Indian and... Public housing, that's where... That's oh, public and Indian housing? Yes, it was one of their forms that says that on the top. Yeah, I... Uh, well, I'm not looking it up right now, but I, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I'm 99% sure. Uh, I mean, we have enough forms in our program for... <laughs> okay, well, that one came up, so I just wanted to double-check. No problem. Okay, thank you. You want to ask about PHAs? <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. And uh, just a reminder to uh, folks who have asked their question already, uh, if you would click your lower hand button. That will uh, help, help me out. But, uh, of course, you're welcome to answer or ask more than one question during the event. So whenever you have a question, click your raise hand button, and then just click lower hand when you're done. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi. 
I'm calling from northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, we have, currently have two houses that we um, are putting on the market uh, that we use funds from NSP1. Is there a checklist or specific documents that we will be required to use um, at the time we sell the properties for closing documents, like a special mortgage, a special note? Uh, we don't have a checklist. I, I think that the, the, the main thing you need to worry about is the affordability, uh, continued affordability provisions. And if you're doing a, a sub second mortgage or writing down uh, the principal amount in some way, uh, you would be recording that with a lien if there are funds uh, that could be repaid or through a covenant if there are no funds that could to be repaid business practice on that, and we haven't developed a specific uh, requirement that you have to have a certain thing. You know, there's so many, I mean, different states have different different closing uh, processes. You know, some some states go through attorneys, some, some states go through title companies, and it, it just wouldn't be possible for us to come up with a, a form that covered all the all right. variables without driving you nuts. So. Oh. Okay, thank you. Sure. But maybe I should say there's probably some checklists in the uh, toolkits. So uh, we have, if you're doing a single-family acquisition rehab resale, uh, the toolkits have a lot of checklists that the uh, TA providers and consultants have put together. And, um, you know, it just occurred to me that I'm, I'm sure there are some. I've reviewed those packages, and uh, I know they have that kind of stuff in there as, uh, you know, suggestions or, uh, you know, voluntary kinds of forms. So. Okay, thank you. I, I thought I heard Hunter coming to the phone. But yes, yes. Um, for the 530-70EZ, we're going to need to check on that one with public housing. Okay. We don't think it applies. Scanning for raised hands. At uh, the moment, there are none. Everybody's burning out. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if something else is going on today. Here we go. We've got uh, one from Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi. Where are you calling from? Uh, City of Springfield, Missouri. Very good. And go ahead with your question. Uh, in the house budget cuts, is there anybody looking at program income as unobligated funds that they can take back as savings? Uh, that's a good question, Bob. I, um, when we had the subcommittee hearing two weeks ago, uh, there were some questions about program income and how come the funds, you know, how come this was a grant program and the money was never coming back to the government. Uh, for those of you who were around at the beginning of NSP1 remember that um, Program income was supposed to come back to uh, the federal government after 2013 or 2014, but um, that was taken out in um, the Recovery Act. And uh, yesterday's discussion really so that so by yesterday, after we had supplied more information to some of the uh, congressional uh, offices. They seem to understand that the program income was there to be used to continue the program, and I didn't hear any of them complaining about that yesterday. So, um, I, I mean, that that's a post, you know, obligation amount of money. So, yeah, but, but that, that that wasn't that wasn't the focus of the uh, NSP Elimination Act. The NSP Elimination Act was going after a billion dollars for NSP three. Um, the, the, the mention of the uh, the program income. Well, in fact, yesterday they said, well, gee, you know, we can see it should be okay for us to take away the, the billion dollars because you can use the program income to keep going. So I, I don't think that's on the table. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sarah. So let's see. Um, okay. We've got uh, survey submitted some information about... Um, the NSP Termination Act, and 
uh, Enterprise is uh, helping to uh, fight that legislation, and uh, you can contact uh, Amanda Roberts at Enterprise, and I'll, uh, in a minute I'll put that uh, information in the chat box for you. Um, and uh, she's the chair of the task force. Uh, that is, uh, is working on this. So um, I imagine they'll be looking for organizations that want to sign on and uh, and help uh, and help with uh, congressional outreach. Jeopardy tune, <laughs> and there we've got a new question, and uh, let me unmute Laura. Hi, Laura. Oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, my mistake there. And, uh, okay, we're still looking for questions, but I'm going to put uh, Amanda Roberts' information in the chat box. I need to send that to all of the participants. There we go. Now in the chat box, you will have uh, Amanda Roberts's information, and yeah, feel free to, to contact her if you would like to help out in the, the task force that's working on the uh, fighting the NSP Termination Act. We'd like so to make sure that we have no position on this. I, um, yes, I would imagine that's the case. So, uh, I hope that is, a, that is an enterprise and, uh, and private, um, probably mostly nonprofit effort going on. So, uh, Art is with us now. Hi, Art. Hello, how are you? Thomas from Fulton County, Georgia. Just had a simple question. Where can I find, and, if they, and are they available, transcripts? Yes, um, all of the webinars that we have are um, archived on the uh, NSP Resource Exchange. If you uh, go to the website, um, the shorthand address that I use is just www.hud.gov forward slash NSPCA. And um, if you look over to the right side of the um, page, at the, towards the top, you'll see a Learning Center. And okay. click on Learning Center, and you'll see uh, previously held uh, webinars, okay. um, and you'll be able to, to download the uh, transcripts, the, um, um, the PowerPoint slide, and, and any materials that were provided with the webinar. Sometimes um, the transcripts and the tapes take a, a few days to get up. There. Yeah, it's usually, it's usually about a week delay. So, um, so yesterday's um, webinar probably won't be there until next week. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Slides are probably up. Yeah, the slides are available right away, though. Thank you. Thank you, Art. And uh, I have a, I'm going to try unmuting uh, Deidre again, but I think she asked her question already. Deidre, do you have another one? versus subrecipient. 
Uh, number one, when do they report program income? Well, uh, developers don't report program income because revenues to developers are not considered to be program income um, as far as official HUD money goes. Now, you know, your situation may be that you've negotiated to get some of that back or your deal may be structured as a loan. Um, so that would be reported uh, monthly. Um, for some recipients, they would do the same as a direct grantee, which is to um, typically report on a monthly basis uh, because you've got, um, you know, the, the program income is going to be coming from your revenue stream, and you would, theor you know, in theory have um, hopefully excess revenues every month. Um, you only report it to us quarterly in your QPR, but um, the develop the sub sub recipient will be reported to you uh, as they receive it, basically. Right. So, so we just want to make sure what we're referring, what we're classifying as program income, is only those funds that are being returned to the grantee or the sub recipient, not the developer. Right. And we we have a full webinar that's coming up on program income on uh, April nineteenth, which will walk you through. Um, what is and is not program income and how you deal with it, how you report it, and so on. Yeah, we, we are hoping to get a policy uh, statement together on them. That one's not um, very far along yet, So, but we know there are a lot of questions. Okay, more? So then there's part two. Uh, can they set aside a capital reserve account? Well, you guys are coming up with all the questions, but we don't have answers for you. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> we're asking them. Um, I think we're going to be approving something on that. It's kind of tied up with a request to allow uh, PHAs to act as developers. Um, and there was a corollary question to allow, uh, in this case, PHAs, that we consider to, you know, anybody, uh, to, to set up operating and uh, replacement reserves. Now, um, what we have said so far is that if your lender, if a lender requires it, you can set one up now. Uh, what we will, I think, soon say is that you will be able to set it up without a lender's requirement because in many cases there is no lender uh, in the project. So um, I, I think you should proceed on the assumption that you're going to be able to do that. I mean, normally re replacement reserves, I think, are something that could be funded out of cash flow. Uh, but, uh, you know, initial operating deficit reserve uh, is something that, uh, for reasons that um, have disappeared into the mists of CBG history, um, has not been allowed. So uh, but I think we're going to be changing that. So uh, part three, then, uh, uh, can they create an operating account? And part four, can they charge a management fee? Um well, reasonable management fees are allowable. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the structure of the of the project. I mean, if it's uh, let's say it's a let's say it's a uh, city that gives them uh, funds to a sub recipient, a nonprofit to to manage uh, to, to to develop and operate and manage a, uh, a multifamily complex. Management fees are uh, you know standard cost of doing business uh, in multifamily, so that one is no problem, um, you know, as long as it's a reasonable fee, fee, you know, similar to what what you would see in the private sector in the marketplace, so, you know, 7%, 10%, whatever. Um, the the operating, operating deficit reserve, I think it's, you know, w what we're hoping to do is create a, a reserve that functions like, I think the home program functions, and I'm not very expert on that, but they seem to have, they seem to allow a reserve that sort of functions, in, you know, for, as kind of everything. Um, that seems simple to me. I think we'll have some limitations in terms of, you know, how dollar limit or months worth of uh, operating deficit or, you know, some, some kind of factor like that. So it's not an unlimited um, uh, pot of money, and there will be restrictions on, how that money how that money can be used, but um, but in general, I think we're going to make it much more similar to uh, you know both home and public public and Indian housing. But the key is program income could be used to fund reserves, and um, 
well, at, at least as far as CDBG goes, um, you can't use it to pay for operating. Well, yeah, but I think that's so, what's going to change is that we would allow them to establish that fund with up front. Up front. But it's, so it's like an up, yeah, but ongoing. Like a savings account, uh, yeah. Well, we're still working that out, but I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, a functional kind of arrangement for people. And, and that should be, I'd say within a month. I mean, that, that whole question is actually tied up with, um, this public housing authority question and, um, and Assistant Secretary, uh, Mercedes Marquez is going to have to talk to, Secretary Donovan about this because uh, it sort of crosses over a number of uh, HUD areas and it's a, a pretty significant policy. So I, I'm not going to say where where that hap where that may land because I'm not sure. But um, I, I don't sense any real resistance to establishing uh, operating reserves uh, at, at some level. Thanks for those questions, Shelley. And uh, Lana has submitted one. It's a potential project sponsor for an MSP3 rental development project has vacant property in their inventory. Would a would use uh, E new uh, would use E new housing construction activity be an eligible use of MSP3 funds without an accompanying acquisition if the property was eligible? That was a mouthful. Um. Yes. I, I mean, I think the question is, do you have to acquire it to make it eligible? And the answer is no, you don't. You know, you may have it. I mean, cities own property that's in their inventory uh, from uh, tax foreclosures. Uh, you know, there could be any number of reasons. The, the, the redevelopment use E is, is considerably more flexible um, than, you know, because the property did not have to have been foreclosed or abandoned first. So, um uh, you know, if you have a specific issue or some specific circumstances that you're concerned about, you know, call, call back in or write us. Uh, but in general, you can do that. Okay, let's go uh, to Gail. Hello, Gail. Hi. <laughs> I was just going to take the um, question in regards to merging NSP1 and 3 one step further and the fact that I was wondering how you report beneficiary information once the project is done. Do you split when you have a multifamily project or do you duplicate? Uh, I'm not the expert on that, but I think that what, what's going to end up happening is that you will um, the address the, the address will be the same, and so what we do is go through and and, and uh, filter by address, so that we would see that even though in the short run there would be duplicate um, reporting, that we can we will clean that out when we uh, compare the addresses from NSP one to NSP two and three. I think that's the general answer, um, and I'm pretty sure about that. But um, how you actually go about doing that I'm less sure of. So um, but I think you do I mean as the was saying earlier, you do have to report it by one S P one and S P three. So I think inevitably you're gonna see some duplication. Um, and you know you won't have the address in, in, in the system or you shouldn't have it in there until you've actually completed the unit. But there's already a fair amount of duplication in the system even within a single program year because the way, it, the way we have you report it, it's by units of service. So when you acquire a property, that's one thing that you've done. When you rehab it, that's another thing that you've done. When you sell it, that's, a, that's another thing that you've done. So, we, you know, that, that, that looks like three things. But once you put the address in there, um, we know it's all one thing. And I think the same principle can apply when you bridge uh, between two different program years. Okay, thank you. All right, Hunter's trying to find a more uh, specific answer for you, but um, we'll, we'll get back if we can. Thanks, Gail. Okay. So you can submit written questions. You can raise your hand. It's 
possible that uh, basketball might be grabbing some people's attention today. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the tournament started. Uh, <laughs> not, not that people do that during work or anything. <laughs> um, you're going to, uh, for the uh, NFC 1 and 3 DRGR question, you're just going to report it um, as completed unit for both. Uh, and then we will uh, weed out when we do counts. Right. Kind of a mess, but it does allow us to, um, I mean, it's hard work, but it does allow us to see those units of service, which we think are worth knowing about, because, you know, when you say to somebody, oh, here's a house, they say, oh, well, that's that's fine, you know, but then you realize, oh, hey, this, this grantee had to buy this house, they had to, you know, get what the amount of work that actually goes into uh uh, to, to creating these projects, um, but um, yeah, so we're, we're constantly coming up with better ways to do the filtering, but it's still not great. And I got to tell you, the New York Times has been going through our whole NSP three, NSP one, uh, DRGR report, and this woman that's doing it seems really sharp. So uh, you know, we're not the only ones looking at that. Um, I really not going to look. Well, we can, uh, we can pause a little bit longer. Um, we, don't have to, we don't have to prolong the agony either. I mean, if, if that's all the questions are, that's fine. Oh, we're waiting for commercial break. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the uh, tennis. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> lots of distractions today. I forgot about the St. Patty's Day one. Um, Tara, ta is it Tara or Tara as I unmute you? It's Tara. Tara, hi, what's your question? Um, I just wanted to know, a question that keeps coming up, and I looked on the FAQ that's been asked about the 25% set aside and the occupancy date for um, it to count as meeting the set-aside requirement, does the unit have to be occupied by the grant term and date? Um, uh, in the FAQ, it says grant closeout date, and I know there's a grant closeout period, so are you all referring to the grant term date or the grant, the 90 days that you normally get to reconcile your grant? Right. So it has to be occupied by then. So, okay, so the, the purpose of, um, of, of, of the 25 cents uh, of the set-aside is to show that uh, you've met a national objective. Right. So you can't you can't meet a national objective until you have a beneficiary occupying the unit. Correct. That's that's my that, that's what I keep responding. But I keep no, they, there's stuff that says this. I just want to make it has to be occupied to count. Correct. Right. Right. And it has to be occupied by a grant end date as far as the contract grant term date is concerned or the grant close out period because everything that I'm hearing and reading and seeing. And you cannot close out your grant until you have a, um, until you've met a national objective. So until you have your beneficiaries in place, right, whether you rent it or, or you sell it. Right. Um, but that is not necessarily tied to the um, end of the NSP term. Okay. It's not necessarily tied to your expenditure date, right? Okay. So there's two different tracks. One is these are the times, the times in which you have to spend the money, mm -hmm. times that you have to show that the money met its intended purpose. Well, and that, that actually applies uh, to, to all the grant uh, tariffs. So yeah, and that's what, it, that's what I assume as well, but they keep asking me the same questions. So I just want to confirm what you no. all consider the grant closeout. Yeah, we have a closeout, and we, and we are drafting a closeout um, policy that actually crosses over in the CDBG and Recovery Act and everything else. Um, and that, that's one of the questions, but, you know, I think in general, you know, if you, the sooner you can get that occupied, occupied the better. Uh, but uh, we haven't figured out, well, you know, so if it's four or five years after you got your grant, you, you still have a unit that isn't, isn't occupied. You know, I don't think we know exactly what, what we're, what we're going to do at that stage. Right. Yeah, the, the, the longer it, it takes for you to meet your national objective is the more we're going to start, start asking questions. Um, right. About, about what your intentions really were. Or, may, or, or maybe the initial plan you had in place needs to be adjusted. 
Right. So the, but the, so the expenditure date is still hard to set. Money still has to be set right. by the grant end date, correct? Right. But if for some reason with a multifamily uh, unit, if it's not fully occupied as the goals that we set for it, by the, the grant end date, there is some leeway with the time period after that to complete the occupancy. Now, will we still be able to report on it? Or will it be the last? Buyer to report on it um, uh, until it's been closed out. Okay, perfect. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because that question keeps coming up, and I'm like, well, there's a difference between the grant term and the grant closeout. Which one are they referring to? So I just wanted to make sure. But then it also starts is it to make sure to keep you all updated on that as right. well, if that's the case. Yeah. Tell your colleagues you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Okay, that's all. Actually, that answers my other question, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Okay, so we're going to move on to Thank you, I do have one more. So a question was brought up about um, if, like, we're in a, a consortium with uh, the City of San Jose, um, so the Housing Trust and uh, a Neighborhood Housing Services Agency. If we have loans that we all provide um, second mortgage loans, if there are properties that are within our portfolios that are going into foreclosure, are we allowed to purchase those with NFP funds to be included in our redeveloped um, projects for sale to new home buyers. So we're not getting any money back because our loans are getting right because they're all a subordinate. But are we allowed to go back in if there are homes that come up that we have provided seconds on to include those in the properties that our developers rehab? Let, 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 let's slow down and, and, and pick up right, the, the um, property that you're referring to. So you, you assisted who is someone in purchasing a property with yes. NFP? No, no, with a, no, with our other funds, our regular um, with, funds. So you, you assisted a home buyer in Correct. purchasing a home, and for whatever reason, the um, they, they weren't able to pay their their private um, uh, mortgage, and, and that lender is looking at foreclosing on it. Correct. Okay, so 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 now you're wondering if you can use NFP. Yes, that's, that's a foreclosed property. Okay, and so there's no uh, conflict of interest or anything if we all had seconds that got wiped. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, Habitat's done this uh, as well. I mean, they're their own lender, so... Uh, right. You know, you're not the owner of the property. You're just a... You're that, the that, that's what makes the difference there, okay. third party. Yes. Right. So to the extent that you want to be reimbursed for your initial investment in it, um, you, you you may be able to do that um, on the back end when you sell this property um, to the you know to the extent that it, that the um, the purchase and, and any rehab you put into it um, um, is provides you with enough um, funding to to be made whole. But for the most part, um, you eat what, what what you lost in in the deal the first time. But um, it's perfectly fine to purchase it with the NSP um, funds. Okay, perfect. Okay, I gave the right answer. All right, great. Thank you. Small crab, a hard question. Jeez. Yeah. Also, people are into it here. You know, really. Here's where you can go for more resources. 
the HUD NSP help website is being added to all the time. And uh, some great stuff there. And uh, lots of upcoming webinars. I know there's another one I'll be involved in next week on the First Look program. It'll uh, highlight uh, the uh, REO Match website as, long as, as well as the FHA First Look website. You may be interested in those. Uh, they're doing amazing things with those websites. Uh, it's come an awful long way in a year. So when uh, when we do end this web uh, end this webinar, you'll be taken to a, a short survey. We'd appreciate any feedback you have to give us how it worked for you, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see in the future, that sort of thing. Please take a moment to answer those questions. We will appreciate that. Uh, we've got a question from Orient. Hi, Orient. Orient, are you there? Yeah. Hello? Hi. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, when do you anticipate approving all the NSPC demo uh, could, can, can you speak up a little bit? When do you anticipate approving all the demo waivers for NSP3? Uh, demo waivers? Uh, yeah. Well, in the next couple of weeks, I hope. I mean, we just have to kind of package them up and, and ship them around. And uh, we have, uh, I want to say maybe about 20, not more than 20, maybe not even that many. Uh, and uh, we have gotten recommendations uh, from the field offices for approval of all of them, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, but we do have to, you know, write up a separate letter. It has to go all the way up to Assistant Secretary Marquez. So, hopefully, two weeks. Uh, you know, now your grantees can go out and start doing demolition now. I mean, if they're ready to. So, you know, it's only when they get to 10 percent of their grant amount that they actually need the the waiver, so that shouldn't hold anybody anybody back from starting their programs, um, you know, unless they're going to spend more than ten percent on one uh, particular, you know, structure or something like that. So, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, usually, when the grantees send out a bid, they usually want to do like as much as they could. So it's usually goes above the 10%, so that's why I asked that question. Right. Well, Fit it out all at once. It's still a spending. I think it's still a spending limit, though. It's not a, I mean, we're not, we're not worried about obligations anymore, so, I mean, they could, in theory, obligate themselves. They just couldn't go past the 10% level, uh, you know, actually writing checks. Okay. So they should be able to, you know, just get out there and proceed, and by the time... You know, I, I, I can't imagine it'd be more than three weeks. I'm hoping, personally, that it's, it's less than two, but I don't know what else to. It's a little hard to know. Okay, thank you. All right, sure. Okay, let's go to Emily. Hello, Emily. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to know about program income. We've closed on a number of properties, um, and we're receiving mortgage payments. I work for a Habitat for Humanity affiliate. Um, so we are servicing the loans ourselves um, and have enough program income that we need to put towards NSP-like activities. So if, I, if we purchase additional foreclosed properties to rehab with to resell, are they subject to same requirements that the original properties were subject to? Generally, yeah. yeah. Now, there's, yeah. there's a little bit of a technical question here, though, because some of the Habitat affiliates are working as developers, and some of them are working as sub-recipients, and it's a little bit different. Yeah. So, so uh, which We're a sub-recipient. We're sub right, okay. Right. Yeah, you, you're going to have to meet all requirements. Yeah, the, 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 the dollars don't get washed because it's program income. Um, program income functions uh, much the same as, as the initial allocation. Yeah, you'll be reporting it. You have to spend it before you make another draw. 
Uh, so, so we've already drawn our full grant amount. So okay. Now all I'm doing is receiving program income and right. basically matching it to eligible costs. And my the original property that we purchased, I'm running out of eligible costs. So we're going to have to purchase another property with program income, um, which is fine. We would be doing that anyway. I just wanted to, I mean, do I need to do things like do an environmental review? Yep. It's just like okay. and it's just like new money, so um, okay. it'll well, continue to be program income until your grants close out, and even then, one of the questions is, you know, what happens to program income at the at the end of the grant, and that's one of the ones we haven't solved yet. So, uh, so yeah, just keep treating it like it's good old NSP money, and enjoy every one of those requests. I'd like to see somebody that did one, so I could see what documents these. That's my thing. I, I just. Okay, let's go uh, to Sarah. Sarah, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Sarah. Not me. We, we can hear you. I didn't have my hand. I asked my question already. Thank you. Okay, very good. And uh, then it is James's turn, or Jim. Hi, uh, we've got a uh, non-profit developer that's been uh, holding onto a uh, piece of property now for about eight years uh, as they've gone through some litigation. Uh, when they bought it, they uh, raised the structure, so it's, it's completely vacant. Uh, and we've committed some home dollars, but we still have a gap. Uh, and now that they've cleared the... Um, for litigation hurdles, would that be an eligible use E for uh, for NSP funding? No, no. It's in your target area, yeah. It is, yeah, it's in our target area. We've already provided funding in the same area for acquisition and rehab of foreclosed upon properties, so it's, uh, it'd be complementary to what we've already done. So you, who's going to buy it? I and mean, is the same nonprofit going to own it and develop the new property, or what? Yeah, it will be uh, owned by the same nonprofit and developed uh, for 16 units of uh, of housing on the site. Yeah, I mean, you you need to do your uh, you know get the environmental done before you officially uh, approve the the funding. You know, or before you use any of the funding. You know, you approve. Exactly. Uh, the funding and then go in with it. But yeah, we're also updating the uh, home NSP handbook. Uh, there was a, a book put out a couple of years ago by the home folks, and we're we're updating that to to account for NSP two and three. But um, it is possible. But you know, you're going to be into when you have home, unless you can clearly split it out. You're you're going to be looking at combining you know, or having eighty percent of median be your upper limit. Uh, Unless you can prorate very clearly. Yeah, I guess for this particular development would be okay because uh, we're a pretty we're a weak market uh, community, and so uh, our, our rents are going to be low, and, and we pretty much are going to have our rents at uh, either home uh, rents or below 80% of median. Okay, should be fine. Yeah, you, you can do that. I mean, um, you know, I guess we've seen some of these projects where uh, there were failed projects that they, you know, they wanted to sell the project to a subsequent purchaser and it included some of the same members and so forth. And those we were concerned because we didn't have faith in the in the in the owner or the developer. But in this case, it sounds like the the, the problems were on the way to the to the developer's capacity. So, um, I mean, that's more of a that's a judgment call on your part. As far as the eligibility goes, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, the litigation had to do with an abutter uh, filing some some claims, so we had to clear a number of hurdles there. Okay. Okay. This, this is all. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Jim. And Mike, where are you calling from? I know. I know we're back to her on that. Mike. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, uh, this is Mike Kleinard with uh, THDA in Nashville. I had a follow-up question about the program, uh, program income. 
If the income is generated from an MSP-1 eligible area, are we always held to that the two MSP-1 eligible areas, or can we broaden out to the better MSP-3 areas? I mean, just because the data is so much better for three. Um, you you can uh, use it in another area, but most likely you would re be required to do an amendment. Um, and so hopefully this guidance that we get out uh, shortly will will affect that. So there's there's a couple of things that that drive uh, amendments. One is your own policies, and then the other is what what I guess is sort of the bottom line type of policy from the um, citizen participation uh, 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 or the uh, co consolidated plan requirements at 91505, which say that the change in scope, location, beneficiaries, or the nature of the project. Uh, is a, is an amendment. So in your case, changing the location uh, would probably be that. But with an NSP-1, it's not that big of a process to go through. I mean, you know, it doesn't come into headquarters. You do your, you follow the same standards that you follow for citizen participation in NSP-1 in terms of publication. Um, you know, I don't know if you have to go, through how much uh, you have to go through in terms of you know, state procedures or local procedures or whatever with, you know, city councils and so forth. But um, from the HUD standpoint, it's not a long process. All right. Now that I'm... Okay, great. That, that answers the question. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Well, that was a big flurry of questions once we uh, thought we might be ending the webinar. So maybe that'll happen again. <laughs> Scanning for questions, scanning for hands. Okay, everybody's taking a breath, processing, thinking, trying to figure out what's happening in the bracket. Uh, so, uh, shall we? Uh, shall we call it? Seeing no more. Yeah, I, think, I, I think we're good if you all are good. And I think by you all, Hunter meant everyone in the audience today. Yes, we're good. We're good. This is okay, us. They're good. <laughs> You're good. And there will be more if, uh, as soon as we end this. If you go, oh, I should have asked, of course, you can uh, still submit questions through the HUD NSP Help website. And there will be additional Q&A webinars coming up in the next couple of months, too. So um, with that, we uh, thank you for being here today. Thanks to uh, all of you at HUD for your uh, answers today and your diligence and getting the correct information and all your work on the program in general. And uh, for those of you who are about to uh, leave from the audience, uh, please take a moment when you're connected with the Survey Monkey survey just to give us a little bit of feedback about this webinar. We'd appreciate that. Ken? So, yeah. Ken, this is Hunter. One last real quick question. Um, the 530-70-ED, the person who asked that question, uh, was, that a, was that a written, did somebody write that question in? or was that Yes, that, that was written. So you have their contact information so we can get back to them? I do. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end. So thank you for being here, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon on another HUD NSP webinar. Take care, everyone.